Divine Truth Assistance Group. These group assistance sessions are about putting principles of divine truth into action. This discussion is part of the 2014 Australia Group 2 series, Jesus Presents Desire for Personal Change. Filmed on the 28th of July 2014 in Monterey, New South Wales, Australia. That fear has to be addressed, guys. That fear you feel as an intrepid fear. Just relax, breathe. Take a big breath. <sighs> right into your diaphragm and just relax and engage. You know, rather than stressing out too much about what's going to happen today. You've got nothing to worry. You're in loving hands. Except when we spank you occasionally. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> alright. <laughs> Okay, well what I'd like to do today is talk to you uh, about the desire for personal change. Now, I would say that the fact that you guys have spent, uh, taken out like nine days of your life and you've spent some money too to pay for the venue to come here and you've spent your time travelling here and travelling back, that, that means that you must have some desire for personal change. Wouldn't you say that's suggestive? Now, that being the case, what we need to do is come up with some kind of practical ways in which we can measure our personal desire. And that's what I would like to talk with you today. But before we get started with that, we'd like to talk to you about our desire for these sessions. Can we do that for a bit, just to talk about what, what we're here for? So we're here to give you some personal assistance and help. So let's, uh, I'll just make sure I'm working here, it is. So that's what we're here for. We want to help you to be able to receive more of God's love in particular, but we'd also like to help you learn how to love your brothers and sisters better. So live in harmony with love and truth as well in your day-to-day -day lives. So there's a number of things which I'll just list quickly, which you can see here, growing in your desire to love God, your relationship with God, becoming a more truthful and loving individual in your personal life. And the last one, well, the last reason why we feel we created this is to highlight the areas where you feel like you're stagnant, where you feel like you're not progressing, where you're stuck, or where you feel you might be in self-deception and show you how to measure your own progress. We feel it's very essential that you learn how to measure your own progress rather than being reliant on somebody else for your progress. The question then becomes, well, why, why do we feel that's essential? So why do we want you to get away from the whole guru type of thing and into your personal development without needing anybody else? Why do we want that? Why, why do you think we want that? Any ideas? If we go up the back, thanks. Sess, on your side there. Good day. Hi, AJ, I'm and Linda. Name, yep, good. <laughs> so, uh, say it everyone. Sorry, I, I, I swamped your name there. <laughs> I'm Linda. Yeah, good on you, Linda. Um, because you want us to develop more God reliance and learn to step into more our relationship with God rather very, than with other people. Very true. Very true. What else? Any other things you can think of? Uh, if we come across to Lorleen on this side. Oh, Lorleen, um, to take responsibility for my choices and my will and wh where I'm taking my life. Good. So uh, uh, the issue of wanting to take personal responsibility for your life. This is very, very good. Yeah. If we go across to Rita. <laughs> Rita, and if I have a guru, then I feel like he or she is my mum and dad, and I don't take responsibility. Correct. So, so if you have somebody you're relying on all the time that's on earth, there's a tendency, isn't there, for you then to put all of the responsibility for your own, for your own welfare and development on that person. Now, can you see why that's so dangerous? If that person misleads you, then you're misled because you've just, you haven't used any logic, any of your own will, you haven't worked out what you want out of your life if you do that. So that none of that is really good for you, right? 
And if you think about the past development that you've been involved with, if those, for those of you who have, you find that every time you develop like that, you get to a point where you just get tired of the process and then you move on. Right? Well, relationship with God is not like that. I've never moved on from that. That's the, that's the main relationship that you develop once you connect to God properly. And you don't feel like moving on with it. And in fact, you never will because it's an it's a infinitely growing relationship that also impacts upon your infinitely growing soul. So these are, these are good reasons why we need to take personal responsibility. Can anybody else have your relationship with God for you? Obviously not. What else, what else besides that can nobody else do for you? You think about that. So Dennis, if we come over here. Dennis, uh, feel your emotions. So nobody else can feel your emotions for you. you many times we'd like them to, right? <laughs> but, but they can't. Yep, Cody, you were going to say? Just wait. Um, I'm Cardi, I had the same answer. Right, no worries. So um, if we go up the back and then down the side, on this side, the bike runners get, uh, get warm while you get to get cold. <laughs> um, no one else can use their own will or pray for courage or long for a desire to God. Good, so nobody else can develop your desire, nobody else can develop your courage. Very true. Kid Kadira, um, no one else can make changes for you. You're the only person who can change yourself, no one else can. Correct. Nobody can do that for you. You see, in the end, nobody can really do much for you. <laughs> can you see that? And yet most of us want somebody to do something for us, if we're honest. In fact, whole religious systems on this planet have all been developed around the concept that somebody else can do something for you. Isn't that true? You look at the Christian faith, the whole idea of the blood sacrifice is all about somebody else doing something for you that you, if you think logically, should have to do for yourself. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is one of the things we'd like you to focus on this time. I'm a self-responsible being. No one else can have a relationship with God for me. I am the only person going to develop my will to be love, loving and truthful. I am the only person that can do that for me. I am the only person who can express my own love. You can't have a relationship with somebody else with them doing all the work. It needs, there needs to be something coming from you and something coming from them into you. And you need to allow both things to occur. Does that make sense? I am the only person who can develop my own humility. I am the only person who can bring life, my life into harmony with God's laws. Bearing in mind that I'm the only person who can do these things, can you see what our focus is going to be this week? Our focus this week is going to be helping you get to know yourself better and helping you become a more self-responsible being helping you to be able to measure how you're doing. So the question then becomes, how do I know if my desire for change is really sincere? How do I know? How can I measure it? What practical things can I do to measure whether my desire for change is sincere? And that's what I'd like to discuss with you now. Does that sound all right? Okay. So how do I know? My actions. Uh, just say your name first. Oh, sorry, it's Susan. <laughs> yeah. And it's uh, my actions, the okay. actions that I take. Okay, but the problem is that many times I actually, when I analyse my actions, I actually believe my actions are right. Is that not the case? No, there's many times when, when you think you're being loving when you're not, right? from somebody else's assessment. So you ask your wife or husband if you're in a relationship whether you've been loving to them today and they'll have a different assessment of that question than you will. Uh, most of the time that's the case. So is there something a bit more like concrete that we can use? If we go to... Uh, my name's Justin. Um, it'll be reflected in what comes back at you. So there's a law of attraction thing. But the problem is, for many of you, when you receive some kind of law of attraction, for example, I'll give you an example. 
if there's a guy who likes women and he gets lots of women interested in him, he thinks, he's going to think that's a good thing. But is it necessarily a good thing? No. Not necessarily. So you can't always assess your law of attraction through your own analysis and through your own feelings because your own feelings are quite often warped. But that would start to feel a bit off after a while. Not for some guys. I know that I've taken 25 years before that I've felt any of it's off. <laughs> and I don't, I don't suggest you take 25 years to work out something's off. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's not as a reliable thing as you might think, is it? Really? If we come across... Um, for me, sorry, no, no. Elvira. Yeah, good, Elvira. Thanks. For me, it's um, when something really painful happens mm -hmm. and I know and I'm trying to work out what's going on, I know I'm sincere when I'm shown. Yeah, but the problem is that a lot of times when something painful happens, you do blame someone else. Yeah, me, me and somebody else at the same time usually. Yeah. Usually, but, but <laughs> blaming someone else means that you don't understand that all of your own creations are coming from within your soul. So, so even that's not reliable, is it? And this is, can you see what the problem is for many of you? You hear a whole heap of truth and then you go through this assessment of how do you know you're living in harmony with it or not. And because your measurement system is unreliable, you can't tell. That's the point I'm getting at. Your measurement systems are unreliable and that's why you're struggling to work out where you are in terms of your own progression. We need to have some kind of more reliable measurement system. Huh? So any other ideas what that might be? Yeah? If we come in the centre here and then, and then down the front. Um, Lani. Um, what was that? Sorry, you know? Lani. Lani. About how um, honest we are with ourselves or humility. Like Good. So now we're getting a bit closer, but how do we measure whether we're really honest with ourselves? That's the question, isn't it? Because a lot of times we think we're being honest with ourselves and we're not being honest with ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we come down to the front here and then on this side if we go to Catherine... That's, uh, so down the front, if you keep your hand up, Nick, yeah, then Sess will be able to help you out. Uh, Nikki, and uh, just basically how much your life's actually changing around you, like all the people around you as well as um, just like your automatic response to things. So based similar like law of attraction events basically yeah so now we're getting so, a bit more reliable aren't we we're starting yeah. to see that like, my <laughs> life has changed in this way if i measure it over time mm. my life has changed in this way yeah and it's a, and it's been an automatic thing it's not been something i've had to force yeah so that's a good indication yeah. isn't it much more reliable so can you see what we're trying to do is we get a period of time in our life and we have to be able to accurately assess where we are at the beginning of this time and we have to accurately be able to assess where we are at the end of the time. Does that make sense? So there is going to need to be some kind of time-based assessment of our life that needs to go on if we're going to accurately see how we're actually doing, how we're progressing. That makes sense to you? Yep. Okay, so what else is involved with this? And if we just think for a moment about time, now that we've brought that subject up, there's, there's something there that will help us. If we go, yep, so just next to you, Corny. Oh, sorry. Let's, you're all right? Sorry. I'll do this occasionally. Um, pain in my body and my health and sickness. Okay, like, but the trouble is what I've noticed is that for myself is that sometimes you're dealing with something, you, you, you're in co total denial of something when you begin, right? And then you think your body's doing fine. And then all of a sudden you start getting into some feelings of resistance towards some emotions and all of a sudden your body's not doing fine anymore. So the average person does what with that? They go, I'm not doing fine anymore, I must be 
I must be going downhill. So don't, don't go further down that track. So they stop even going further into the analysis or the feeling of their emotion because they feel that it's actually ramped up the amount of body pain that they have. And it does. That's the reality. It does. And it will do until you're over that hump of resistance and into actually processing the emotion. So I don't even think that's a reliable indication, really, of how much pain I've got going on in my body. Yeah. Okay. Something to do with time. Yeah. Will you come down, Marco? Marco, my name is. I guess time to reflect on yourself, like just spending a lot more time on yourself. True, that's something you need to do. Um, and, a, and a person who's humble would certainly do that. But I'm talking now about some kind of measurement system. Something that we can measure what's going on in terms of the progression in our life. Okay, if we go up to the back there, Miranda. Yeah, I find from my own experience Miranda, it's... Miranda, name. Sorry, my name is so, Miranda. Yeah, good <laughs> on you. Just get you into that habit for the next couple of days. Okay. My, uh, from my experience, it's like it takes less time to recognize either, you know, like, I mean, the, um, to the addictions yeah. within myself and also the pain. And, and just like the discomfort, you know, if something is not right. Yeah. Oh, while I agree to a certain extent, I've seen people try to recognise things that they say they recognise, and I'm going, I'm sorry, you're in total delusion. <laughs> so I, I don't know if that's that reliable. You need, you need, what I'm trying to get is you need a reliable way, you see. There's supposed to be something that's reliable, that applies to everybody, that makes it a bit easier. If we just come forward one, yeah. Hi, I'm Julie. I think a record, writing down a record of day-to-day -day things or your emotions or how you're feeling, so you're keeping a diary of how you're going. Yep, so what is the record doing? Um, it's, it's a self-reflection. It's a self-reflection tool, but yep. if you're not very good at self-reflection, you're not going to write down things that are very honest. In well, the diary. that's growing in integrity and, and, and honesty, isn't it? Yeah, but it? many of us have no integrity. Okay. Like, um, to, honestly, you, many of you think you've got integrity, but you haven't got integrity yet. Then it's a desire for, for growth first towards God. Yeah, and, but a lot of you think you've got a desire for growth, <laughs> but you measure that just externally. You just go, oh, because I went along to a seminar about growth last weekend, it means I've got a desire for growth. When it could just mean that there were a, lot, a bunch of people there who fed your addictions and you really wanted to be there because all of those people would give you what you wanted. Or it could have even been that a spirit motivated you to go there because he wanted a whole heap of addictions met when he went there. You know, it could be any of those things. So how do you measure whether this is actually going on or not? All right, if we come down to Nick again and on this side, Pierre. Yeah. Uh, could it be how many times you pray and, and also how many times you actually receive God's love? Okay, so now we, there's, a, there's a thing you've raised. How many times or how much time do I spend doing something? Should we put that as number one on our list of self-analysis? <laughs> Shall we do that? This is going to be a fairly accurate measurement of what happens over a period of time and also what happens daily. So let's rub that off and we'll just put up the top here. Some of this sticks a bit. How I use my time. Um, how much, uh, Gary, how much time we spend with God or, or, or praying or... Yeah, well, let's, let's, take it, let's make it as wide as possible. How much time do you spend doing anything? <laughs> let's compare the amount of time you spend doing things. This is number one on our list. How much time you spend doing something demonstrates how dedicated you are to that thing. Is that not the case? So if you say, I'm really dedicated to personal progress, but through the course of one month, 
you never read a book about personal development, you never uh, analyse yourself and you basically just work hard and sleep and eat and drink, party hard, whatever, and then at the end of the day you say, yeah, I'm really interested in personal development. What you're saying doesn't match how you're spending your time. And we need to become very accurate and we need to have a very accurate analysis of how we spend our time. How do I use my time? Is, is number one question I need to ask myself. How am I using my time? Right now, how are you using your time? Well, you're using your time demonstrating some of your desire by actually being present. But, but what's your normal life like? What's your day-to-day -day life like? How much of your daily life is spent with the way you use your time in, in harmony with what you call your desire to change or in disharmony with what you call your, call your desire to change or is completely just useless to change? It's just feeding the current status quo. How much of your time is being used? That's a very good question, isn't it? Okay, let's, let's analyse time for a moment. How much time do we have in a week? Seven days by 24 hours a day. How much does that work out to be? Seven fours, 28. How's it work out? Seven is fine. And 68, okay. So that's how much we've got. How much time? How much of the time would the average person spend sleeping? Because we're talking about analysing the time that we know we're using. See, for many of us, we, we, when we, every night when we go into our sleep state, we've got no idea how we're using our time. Right? And many of us can't have a, don't have a memory of how we're using our time, so it's pretty pointless trying to analyse that when we don't even have a memory of how we're using it. Let's, let's focus on the time that we actually have a memory of, right, that we can actually connect to so that we analyse this question. So, so how many hours a night? Eight, nine? Six, seven, eight, nine? Let's, let's be really generous. Nine times by seven? Nine, seven, uh, all right. So 105 is left, right? All right. Now, how much time would you spend going to the toilet, you know, feeding yourself, washing yourself, bathing yourself, all those kind of things if you analyse that in a day? Well, it depends how much water you're drinking. <laughs> like, you're drinking a lot of water. Did you find that you had to go a few times this morning? Yeah, a bit more, to bit more than usual, but, but it's still not very long, isn't it? Like, let's say it's five minutes for a number one, or well, it depends how you number them, I suppose. <laughs> ten minutes for a number two, one number two a day, and ten number ones a day. You might have an hour cho ha an hour done there, right? And so it's an hour. What about meals? Preparation of the meal, clean up after the meal, and you might you might have three meals a day. You might spend a half an hour, three quarters of an hour preparing the meal. Fifteen minutes having it. You know, another 10, 15 minutes tidying up afterwards, there's an hour and a half times three, that's four and a half hours plus the ones, five and a half hours. Let's make it six hours, shall we? We've been pretty generous there, six hours. So we take six hours. So what are we left with now? 99. What's wrong? Oh, of course. So what is it? Six times seven. Yeah, see, good analysis. Good. So, so what's that? Five, take two, three. So what's left? Yes. Okay. So we got sixty-three left. Okay. Sixty-three hours. That's what's left in our week. How have you spent your sixty-three hours? How many hours of that sixty-three do you spend making money? For a lot of us, that might be what? 40. So what does that tell us? We're not interested in our feeding our desires and passions. We're interested in making money because we're worried and we're afraid. And we, we're afraid that we're not going to be looked after if we do things God's way, which is engaging your passions, do the things you love and earn money doing that. We're afraid to engage that process. And so what do we do? We spend 40 hours a week or, you know, for the average person, that's probably about it, working on things often they don't like doing, right? to get money. So what does that tell us about our fear of financial issues? It tells us we've we got large fears surrounding financial issues. 
And to be honest with you, all of you do. All of you have large fears surrounding financial issues. You don't believe doing things God's way is going to make your life better, more financially stable or secure. You believe we live in this world and we've got to make men's meet in this world and so you spend a lot of your time doing it. You spend, in fact, two-thirds of the usable time satisfying this fear. Okay. Anything else that comes up? What do you, what, how much time do you spend watching telly? Or, or watching movies or entertainment? Let's call it, shall we call it entertainment involving a screen? Would it be one hour a day? For the majority of people on the planet in the Western society, it probably would be nowadays, wouldn't it? At least one hour a day. All right. So of the 23 left, there's 23 left, right, after the 40 is taken, and seven of those, that's one third of that, is taken watching, watching things. So now we're up to 47 out of 63. What else? How about spending time with the fam, the family? How much time do you spend there? It depends, I suppose, if you've got a family or not to spend time with, doesn't it? But we need to analyse that, put that in. Can you see what I'm trying to encourage you to do? Analyse the time accurately that you spend doing things in your life. Do it accurately. Do it without any judgement or you know, any trying to fudge the figures. Just do it accurately because it's really plain what's going on once you start analysing the time. You see, if we look at just work and entertainment, there's 47 hours out of 63, which is more than two-thirds. It's nearly three-quarters. It is three-quarters, actually, isn't it? 45 out of 60 is three-quarters, so it's pretty close to three-quarters of our time is being used on work and entertainment. Now, I'm really passionate about my relationship with God, but I use three-quarters of my time doing something other than my relationship with God. Does that now sound like you're passionate about your relationship with God? I I don't think so. If we're honest with ourselves, it doesn't, it's not, right? We need to be honest with ourselves here. What it does is it feeds my desire for fear about my financial welfare and it feeds my desire for relaxation because I'm so afraid half the time that I need time to relax, to feel, right? So I need to de-stress myself from my hard working life, which is all about my fear, and so I use some forms of entertainment to distress myself. None of these things would be necessary if I actually develop my relationship with God and my soul, but, but we do them because we think we have to. Because that's where our real priorities are, if we're honest with ourselves. Huh? What do you feel about that? Is that not true? We're analysing how we use our time here. A person who's really desirous of growth and change and and a desire for God, would they be using their time where three quarters, 75% of their time is being used for something that doesn't help them grow or change? That's the question we need to ask ourselves, you see. We go... Good morning, Glennis. I'm just wondering about um, taking self-responsibility because um, I work a full-time job and before then I was struggling financially. So I took on the full-time job to be more responsible and pay my bills. Yes, if you you weren't taking responsibility for your life before you got a job and then you now got a job to take responsibility for your your life, I feel that's a positive move in self-development. It's definitely more harmonious to care for yourself rather than expecting the world and, or the social system to care for you. Yes. Definitely. I still find myself with no time. Yes. Um, to but also, what kind of job did you take? It's a pretty stressful job. Okay. So, so this is where we're not using our time in harmony with self-development because we're not loving ourselves. See, if we loved ourselves, we'd choose a job we really, really love and we'd dedicate our time to doing that job 
and in time we would have enough funds to... And so you might switch it over, you know what I mean? You might start by taking responsibility, working in a job, and then you might change the job in such a way or do additional things in such a way that allow you to change the job. This is what you would do if you were wanting to grow. But if you don't want to grow, you would grab the job because you, you're worried about the money, right? And you know you have to take self-responsibility, so you do that. And so you grab the job and then you hold on to it for dear life for the rest of your life. That's not working for me. No, it's not going to work for anybody, right? Because most of us don't have a job we like. So, of course, sooner or later it's not going to work. I do have a desire in what I'm doing yep. and I do enjoy it, but it's just loaded with a lot of stress yes. that I so, didn't realise was going to possibly be there. Yes, but, but we've also got to say, OK, yeah. I'm in this job, I need to have a job for self-responsibility. How can I grow in the way I engage this job that's completely in harmony with love. One way is by somehow removing the stress out of the job. Now, stress is not to do with externals. Stress is to do with what's going on inside of yourself, Sorry. right? Yeah. See, this is where I'm saying. So, so you could actually use the 40 hours that you spend at a job in self-development. You could. But the fact is that most of us don't. Because we're too afraid to challenge this area of it, we're too afraid to challenge that area. We do all sorts of things in our jobs, just pandering to the system, because we're too afraid to do anything, because what are we really afraid of? We're really just afraid of losing the job. Yes, yeah. All right. I have um, spoken truth to some of the clients, and my boss says that um, in my position I'm not allowed to say things. Well, see, now you're just using, to me, you're just using excuse. I, I, yeah. Like if my boss said to me, <laughs> I'm not allowed to say things about my personal ideas and concepts, I'd say, fine, I've got no problem with that. That doesn't stop me from growing. Yeah, I probably didn't explain that properly. Um, I have um, people... Um, I need can, to ask can you the just... Man. See, I think I need to hold up my finger to you today. Yeah, that's, this is resistance. Yeah. This is resistance. Right. This is like this is you not wanting to come face to face with how you use your time and analyze it accurately and be honest with yourself. Right? You what you want to do is come up with a whole heap of excuses of why your life right now is the only way you can make it. And a person who desires personal change doesn't do that ever. They don't ever do that. So that's, that's resistance. You know what that's resistance to? Because this brings me to number two in my list. You follow? So that's one. The second way we measure whether we really want to change or not is by our resistance to truth, which is exactly what you just had. Yeah, you can have the mic back, that's fine. <laughs> Might get a number two, though. It's, 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 it's which way are you going to go? Sure, it's fire away. <laughs> no, no, use, mic, use the mic. Um, could you give me any hint as how to change it around? Like, uh, the resistance is I'm not sure what to do. Like, um, yeah, it's, to turn it's that into driven personal growth. by fear. Your resistance is driven by fear. Um, right? So it's that simple, just... Well, you, your next talk that Corny's going to give you, you'll, you'll start to analyse your fear a bit and see whether it's even real. Because a lot of your fear is not even real. Right? You're just making excuses many times. But your resistance is driven by fear. Right? And you excuse it. That's the problem. You excuse your fear. You go, no, my fear says to me, I can't do that. And so you don't. Now, a person who loves truth doesn't do that. They don't go, I don't want to hear that because I'm afraid. They don't do that. Huh? So this is how you measure whether you really want to grow. You do not really want to grow. You want to resist the truth. So be honest about it. Every time you feel that feeling, just that slight feeling of resistance, be honest about it. Feel that feeling. Go, yeah, here it is again, that same resistance that I have to just feel the truth hitting me and feel what it's going to mean to my life. It's going to mean my life changing. I don't want to change, really. 
I want everything to be safe, secure, under control. This is a problem you know you've had for a long time and you're not feeling the emotion. Now, many of you who are stagnant have this problem. You're not feeling the emotions involved with how much control you want in your life. That's fear. That's going to resist the truth. You're going to be pushing the truth away. We're trying to help you do the opposite this week. We're trying to help you have no resistance to truth and already there's resistance to truth. No, I don't want to hear that. No, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to look at how I use my time. I don't want to see my emotional response to truth. If you're honest with yourself, how many of you have a great emotional response to truth? I've met a few of you already in the audience yesterday who do have a great emotional response to truth. But in my personal reflections, there's not many of you who do. You have instead a resistance, a pushing away of truth. That's where the majority are, pushing away truth. Lani, so is resistance always come with a feeling of fear? Not, not always, no. It can be feelings of shame or guilt or, you know, there's all sorts of feelings, anger associated with, with the feeling of resistance. It really doesn't matter what the feeling is. You can recognise the feeling easy enough, right? Anybody around you can feel it. Like, as soon as you start engaging a conversation, as soon as somebody raises a problem, they're in resistance. See, see, if you were really dedicated to personal changes, there wouldn't even be problems in your life, there'd be solutions in your life. Isn't that true? If you were really dedicated to personal change, you'd be looking at everything from, how can I solve this? What can, you'd be very positive. You wouldn't be going, no, I don't want to do this, no, I don't want to do that. And Just so that, forth. like, fear, like, grips me and... Honestly, as you'll find the next talk, you're using fear as an excuse to not do things. Like, don't, like, I've got lots of fear still. I don't use it as an excuse to not do things or to do things. You do. This is the problem. You're using things as excuses. That's causing resistance to truth. You say, you're, say, you're really saying inside of yourself, because I have this fear, I shouldn't have to. That's what you're saying. And that's resistance to truth. Yeah. Okay. Okay, any idea what the third one might be that you can measure? These are ways that you can measure what you do in your life. If you're honest, again, it's going to require some honesty, but, you know, these are pretty straightforward things that you can do. What's the third one? Any idea what that might be? Yeah. Should we come to across the hand to here? Hi, I'm Ento. Um, the amount of time you spend doing your desires. Okay, so can we say that a bit differently to what you've said it? How I'm going to say how I use my will. Now, today we're going to introduce you to a concept about how you use your will. Mary's going to do that in a talk today. So I'm not going to get much into it. What I'm going to do is ask you to look at your daily life and see how you use your will. So, so when a situation comes up in your life, for example, that is traumatic to you, that where your fear gets triggered or your shame gets triggered or another emotion you don't like feeling gets triggered, how do you respond? Do you use your will to love or do you use your will to attack, resist, run away and all those other things? Which way do you use your will? You can measure that. You can be honest about that and measure that. For the majority of us, we don't use our will to love. We use our will to to do anything but love in many cases, right? We're using our will in an opposite direction. So this is the third way. You can measure these things. So what I'm, what I'm trying to encourage you to do is to spend your time measuring these things in your life. 
have some time of self-reflection, right? where you actually sit down and measure how you spend your time and measure how you feel when truth hits you. Measure your resistance to truth. Right? Notice what you do. And use, ask yourself how you use your day-to-day -day activities, your will. Now, I'm just going to run through some options here to help you with this thing. Now, remember this PowerPoint presentation is already on the internet, so you don't have to worry about how fast I go. So you read all that? That's good. Okay. Okay. This is the time question. How do I use my time? We've already covered a lot of this. Do I use it for working, entertainment, working towards my hobbies, responding to crises in my life, getting addictions met in my relationship with others, spending time with people with common interests, doing things for myself, getting my addictions met with activities and food and drink, All right? suppressing and resisting my real emotions, trying to have fun to mask how I really feel. Is that how you're using your time? Or maybe you're spending your time praying. Or maybe you're spending your time reflecting upon God's truth or reflecting upon your life or improving your understanding and practice of God's laws or experiencing your true emotions or alone working on improving yourself, improving your relationship with your partner, with your children, with your friends, with other people, becoming more loving to others and yourself. Compare the time is what I'm suggesting to you. How much time you spend doing one thing compared to the time you spend doing the other thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, Rita, you want to say something? Uh, Rita, does it also mean I can do the same things almost, but I approach it differently? I um, do it with more honesty and with more feeling, like if I prepare a meal or if I, I don't let my thoughts run wild or go back to the past or... Remember I'm asking you to, to do this what you do automatically, not what you try to do. Because as you're going to learn tomorrow, a lot of what you're trying to do is actually not your will. Right. And as you'll learn today, actually, yeah. as well. So, so, when, so you I, I, yeah. when you suggest uh, I'm there cutting, preparing my meal, I try to have a feeling of love towards my meal. Well, that's you trying. If you yeah. don't automatically have a feeling of love towards your meal, then you're, your soul's already gone somewhere. Yeah. Right? Or th while I prepare the meal, thinking about the family or so, instead of being worried about stuff. But it's right. It's trying. Correct. That's and what we're stuff. talking about here is automatically. What am I doing automatically? See, see I'm not saying change it. <laughs> see, this is where a lot of you get straight away in a problem. You think that as soon as I say, look at how you use your time, look at your resistance to truth, look at how you use your will, you think, oh, I've got to change that now. No, I'm not saying change it. I'm saying analyse it. I'm saying sit down and work out how much do I use my time, how much don't I? That's all I'm asking you to do right now. Changing it's a whole different process, right, than what you've been previously engaging. Changing it's not going to be trying to do something different. So I'm not suggesting that you work out, oh, 70% of your time is done using, with all these things that you really don't help you grow. I'm not saying change that. I'm saying measure it. Measure that. Make sure every day you know that's what you're doing. You're spending 70% of your time doing something that's not helping you grow. How does that feel? <laughs> that's what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting you measure it. Because you don't have to change, you're not going to be able to change it until you, something inside of you changes so that you can automatically change your life. I'm not suggesting you, you need to work hard to change your life. I'm suggesting you need to measure where you are right now accurately because your feelings motivate your choices and decisions. Your desire for real change, for real personal change, is all motivated by your current emotional condition. And there's only, one there's only these accurate ways of measuring that condition. And the accurate ways of measuring the condition are, how do I use my time? How much do I feel resistance to truth? And how, how, where do I use my will? Do I use my will loving or do I use my will opposite? Or even with no consideration of love? What, how do I use these things? And I'm saying to you, measure it. Don't worry about changing it yet. Just measure it. Do you follow? Measure it. 
Because if you don't measure this accurately, you do not have an accurate assessment of your true desire. You don't. You need to measure it accurately. Does everyone get that? Yeah? No? This is what I'm saying to you. Let yourself go through the measurement process without judgment. And Rita, you are terrible with judgment. You like every single time you you analyze anything, you're instantly in judgment of yourself or somebody else. Right? Now, if we if most of us are honest with ourselves, isn't that what we do? We go, oh, yes, I do use my time 75% of the time doing pretty much nothing that helps me grow. Oh, I'm a terrible person. That's the next step. No, that's not where I want you to go. It doesn't mean you're a terrible person. What it means is there's things in your soul that are controlling your life that while they remain in your soul, you're going to keep doing what you do. That's what you're going to do. You're going to keep doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different result, but you're never going to get one. To change that, to actually measure your desire, so this is all about, remember, measuring your desire. How do I know if I have a desire for personal change? Right? What I'm going to have to do is measure it. And these are the ways I measure it. Measure the desire. Without judgment, without self-condemnation, without attacking yourself, without trying to change something when you don't feel like changing it, just measure it. Have I made that clear? <laughs> you know, all of us are getting, we get too far ahead out of ourselves, right? We get far too far ahead of ourselves. What we're trying to do is we're trying to go, okay, I do that wrong, so I need to change that right now. No. You need to recognise there's something in your soul that causes you to take that action. And that thing in your soul needs to be found. That's the only way things are going to change. Right? Uh, like, so we, we don't want you doing what a religious faith would do. You know, We give you ten commandments and you follow them. That doesn't help your will. It doesn't help your desire. It doesn't help your relationship with God. It doesn't help anything. It just means that you're a good, obedient person and most of the time you're doing it for an ulterior motive. That's all that means. And that's not will, that's not desire to love, that's not desire for truth, that's none of those things. It's all just a great big facade, which we'll talk about with you tomorrow, the facade. What we want to focus on you on is this. Measure where you're at right now. Use these three techniques to measure where you're at. This is what I do every day. Every day. I measure where I'm at. And I do it without judgment of myself, without condemning myself, without punishing myself, without making myself feel bad, without hooking into a whole heap of spirits who want to make me feel bad about it. None of those things. I do it because I need to know where I am right now before I'm going to make any real change. That's why I do it. And that's what I'm suggesting you need to do. Now, as we've seen, and as you've already raised, there, are, there, there is obviously resistance to doing this already. Right? Even in this analysis, you're already resistive, many of you, to doing this. Why? Because you judge and you have all these other feelings. But most of the time when you get down to it, we're actually very afraid to do this. Why are we afraid to know the truth so much? It doesn't make any real sense, does it? It's only the truth, once we know where the truth is, if we know where we are, where we are right now, and let's say it's there, right? And here's where we're aiming. We've got to know what's in between, don't we, to a degree. We've got to know where we are right now in order to change. We've got to know what we need to work on. Right? If you can't accurately and honestly measure this point, ground zero, if you like, where you are right now, then how are you ever going to measure whether you've changed or whether you really even desire to change? It's going to be pretty hard, isn't it? So our suggestion is this. Use these three questions to 
analyse your personal desire for change and rather than condemning yourself and judging yourself and thinking you're a bad person because the numbers all crunch down to the fact that there's very little desire to change, you then know, ah, oh, I have very little desire to change. And that's a great thing to know. Because then you can ask yourself this question, why do I have very little desire to change? Right? But if you think you already have a huge desire to change and your life is proving that you really don't, then you're just fooling yourself and being self-delusional. Now, trust me, no self-delusional person can have a relationship with God. And honestly, no self-delusional person can have a relationship with themselves or anybody else really either. So that's a pretty pointless thing to do, be self-delusional. We're better off being honest. But you need to learn how to be honest without judging yourself. You need to learn to do that. Does that make sense? So, homework. What's your homework, do you think? Ask yourself those three questions, all right? And do it without judgment. Do it without judgment. What, how am I using my time? How much resistance, if I'm honest with myself, how much resistance do I have to truth? And how do I use my will daily? Do I use my will to love or do I use my will uh, like I just go where the flow goes, where anything takes me? Where, how do I use my will? Is my will even very developed at all? Ask yourself those questions. So get out that notebook that you brought with you that Mary suggested you needed to bring in her emails to you and start noting down these things. Make an accurate assessment of how you use your time, how much resistance you have to truth, and how you use your will. Can you do that? So that's first homework. Giddo. That's what I'm going to leave you with. Now, I must say, though, we've already identified, haven't we, through this discussion and the feelings that you already have that demonstrate that you must have some fear of change. Is that not true? There's got to be things here that you're afraid of. Now, for some of you, you're afraid of losing relationships. For some of you, you're afraid of what you might find in the future about yourself. For some of you, you might find that you, you, you think you start feeling you're a terrible person and all those kind of things. There's all sorts of things that you might discover in this process about yourself and your feelings. And many of you have terrible feelings about those things that cause you to live in your fear. So the question then becomes, how am I going to resolve my fear of change? And what is my fear of change really? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to have a break for five or ten minutes so you can go to the toilet, and then Cornelius is going to come up and talk with you about the subject fear of change. Does that make sense? So let's do that. <laughs>